Morning, everybody. Dr. Gillard here. Let's do some dermatology, shall we? It's week six, and we are going to dedicate this whole section to malignant melanoma. Lots of pictures on this one. Here we go. So some AKAs, cutaneous melanoma, malignant melanoma, melanoma, superficial spreading melanoma, SSM. There's different types. There's nodular and superficial spreading, which some authors, mostly some internet websites and stuff, they don't realize there's different types of melanoma. So melanoma is the family category. There are several different types. We'll go over the two most common types, actually the three most common types. So it's a, what is it? It's a mutation in melanocytes. Remember we talked about those cute little melanocytes before last week. And they become mutated, immortal. They can't die, just like all cancers. And they live forever, and they grow very rapidly. And so it's a cancer of melanocytes. And it's the skin is the number one spot, but there's other places you can get it as well. The mucous membranes, any of the mucous membranes, inside the mouth and the tongue and the gums, in the conjunctive of the eye, Inside the vagina is a mucous membrane, any mucous membrane. Also inside the eye, some other places which you can't see, you can rarely get these. Uh, the leptomeninges, in case you forgot what leptomeninges, lepto means leave out. They left out the dura mater. So leptomeninges are the pia and arachnoid mater, so you can get lesions there. Very rare though. Uh, it is a very, very dangerous cancer because of its ability to metastasize, especially the nodular form of this disease. It can kill people really, really fast. And we'll talk about that. So its ability to metastasize, it can get to any organ, the lungs, the brain, the liver, you name it, the spine. It can go anywhere. Again, the... the uh, mutated and immortal melanocytes. They grow out of control. They're immortal. We talked about that already. Some types are more aggressive than others. The most common type of this luckily has a slow radial growth phase. So if this is your this is your skin here, there's your thumb. So you just have a couple fingers here. We'll change the color. So, for example, superficial spreading is the most common type. It usually starts to grow, and we'll say this is the dermis also, this blue. usually grows in the dermis, and it spreads horizontally. That's called radial growth. So there is a radial growth phase, and you notice this ugly thing starting to grow on your skin, and you get to the dermatologist. This one at least gives you time to get to the dermatologist in most areas. Of course, in the Bay Area here before COVID-19, it was five month wait to get in to see a dermatologist, even more, six months, seven months, uh, Stanford. I know because I've went through that to get in. So it can be, this is not good. They need, we got, the Bay Area has way too many people and not enough doctors in it. But anyway, so then what happens after a certain maybe eight months, maybe a year and a half, maybe four months, the radial growth phase is over and it grows down. And once it gets into the subcutaneous tissue in particular, these cells, they're not very clumped together. They can fly off, get into the lymph system. And of course, if you get into the lymph system, you're in the blood and you can spread to any any spot in the body via this me mechanism. This is called the vertical growth the vertical growth phase when it grows vertically. VG for vertical growth. Right? The second most common type, that would be the nodular form of this disease. I didn't want to spoil the surprise of that. But this one has no, no radial growth phase. This one just grows straight down. And therefore, within months, a couple months sometimes, all of a sudden, you start seeing a big bump, a nodule, first a papule and then a nodule. And that thing is, that's horrible cancer. By the time you get in, if you're in the Bay Area, 
by the time you try to get into Stanford, this could already be metastasized in some cases. So this is a really bad one, as we'll look at. And that's the second most common cause of malignant melanoma. There are some genes muta gene mutations. I had a whole bunch of stuff on this. I took these slides out, though. I think we don't need to go into the weeds unless you're going to become a dermatologist. So I'll let somebody else do that. But I think you should know the three most common gene mutations that greatly increase your chances of getting this disorder. So it's the BRAF gene, the BRAF, known as the BRAF gene, uh, the NRAS or NRAS, NRAS, and the KIT gene. So mutations in all of these things can lead to mutations and immortality of the melanocytes. They all make the melanocytes turn into monsters. Okay, at, now it's interesting. This might have changed already because I was comparing uh, Habif. I originally made this series with Habif and Fitzpatrick. And then I got a really, really good evidence-based book, really expensive, called Bologna, and comparing it more recent. And some of these numbers have already changed. But at 2014, it was the fifth most common type of cancer in men in the United States, sixth most in females. The lifetime incidence at that time was 1.5%. So almost 2% of all humans are going to get this cancer at some point in their lives. That's a big number, especially for such a deadly cancer. In 1935, the risk was 0.07%. There's one thing about this cancer, keep in mind with regard to epidemiology, this guy is getting worse and they don't know why it is. It, theories are about the ozone letting more UV radiation in. It's probably one of the strongest theories. And other pollutants that are other environmental factors. They don't know why, but this one is really increasing, as we'll see. So as I just said, the incidence is increasing faster than any other type of cancer. It's thought to double every 15 years. That's right, the incidence doubles every 15 years. Uh, so that's crazy. Uh, white People, you Google White People, great, great movie, right? If you haven't seen White Men Can't Jump, that you that's a must-see. Older movie, but it's great. This is a white man. So, yeah. Uh, white people have a tenfold greater risk compared to other races. Uh, we'll look at a like subungual uh, melanoma. There's That one does favor black people more, but we'll get to that one. But in general, the superficial spreading and the nodule, the two most common types of these things. Uh, it's more of a white people disease. The skin's not protected, right? We talked about how melano melanocytes make melanin and they shield the cells. Like he has way more melanin in his skin cells than Woody Harrelson does. Right, people in Australia, New Zealand, which are closer to the equator, have more sun there at more risk uh, than anywhere else. The median age of diagnosis is about 57. The median age of death, it's not 90 or 80, it's seven, uh, 67 years old. So that's not, I mean, it's old, but that's not like crazy old. Epidemiology, so here's the one that changed. So. I used the U.S. the CDC guy uh, census data in 2014. It was 80 percent of the deaths in 2014, and now there's several sources that put uh, the piece of the pie at greater than 90 percent, 98 percent in one study. So it's if you're going to die of skin cancer, it's going to be this one. Greater than 90 percent of all skin cancer deaths are related to this one. And this one is also the most common type of cancer in young adults. And we'll look at some of those, especially young females in their teens and 20s. So this is a nasty, nasty disease. There's some genetic, some different risk factors. So a family or personal history of melanoma. So if your mom or dad have had melanoma or your grandparents, you're at risk. Of course, if you've had it in the past, you're at risk for getting it again. If you're white, Caucasian, lightly pigmented skin, tendency to burn really easy. You all know those people, especially people with red hair, really light skin. They can't tan when you're young. You go to the beach, you don't tan very good. You just turn red. 
That's an increased chance of developing later skin cancer. And then having this disorder, um, xeroderma pigmentosa, is, you guys know that already, I'm sure, but that is a genetic order, disorder, that messes up all your DNA repair systems. I won't dive into the genetics of it. Remember, there's several systems we have for checking the the DNA sequence to make sure there's no mutations, and you have disorders in that machinery, that xeroderma pigmentosa. How about some environmental risk factors? So, yeah, if you have had a lot of sunburns when you're little, that increases the chances of all skin cancer. Chronic exposure to the sun. If you're an outdoor worker and you're exposed to the sun, whether it just be a patch in the back of your neck and the rest of your body's covered, you forget to cover that, increases the chances for cancer. Tanning bed youth, especially in the teens. Never let your teenage kids go into tanning booths. No matter what they say, there's they do increase the chance for future cancer, second and third decades of life. And having a lot of uh, melanocytic nevi, which are, those are just moles, right? And we'll talk about moles next time, I think. I want to talk about moles. And uh, lentigo lesions, but multiple lentigo patches. We talked about lentigo. I don't think I told you this word, lentigenes. Lentigenes just means when you have multiple lentigo lesions all over your body. Uh, those are lenti- the patient's very lentigenous. And those are called lentigenes. What's an even stronger risk factor? If you have a combination, start having combinations. Maybe you've had some severe sunburns in your life and you're always exposed to sun. And you go to the tanning bed in the winter. That's a really high risk. ABCs, I think we've done this before. Bologna adds one in there. So for you know, for chiropractors and for all primary health care providers, even MDs, I mean, unless you're a dermatologist, I wouldn't mess with if, if it breaks, if the lesion breaks the ABC rules, ABCD rules, and even E, Bologna wants to add an E in there. Uh, you need to refer them. Let the dermatologist deal with that. That That's their specialty. Make the referral. Write it in your chart notes. So if they die, they, they won't come back and try to sue you because you didn't tell them. Because sometimes you tell them and they don't do it. So make sure you write that in your soap notes that you referred them. Uh, but here's the ABCs. A for asymmetrical. Uh, it's You can't fold it in half. The shape is asymmetrical. The borders are choppy and rat-bitten and chopped, so the borders are really irregular. The color is, it's multicolored or it's variegated is the word for that. The diameter is at or greater than six millimeters, so that's the pencil size. The number two pencil's eraser is six millimeters. It's not that big, right? And Bologna wants to add evolving this is probably the most new research on this says probably the best way for a patient to tell when it's time to see a dermatologist is if the mole is changing or if the skin lesion is growing. And when these these skin lesions come on, I mean, if I have several of these uh, right now that have come on within a year. Once I turned 60, all of a sudden they started coming on. Uh, so that's like, wow. So evolving is is one of the best ways a patient can help themselves by getting themselves to a dermatologist. Most dermatologists don't you don't don't require that your primary send them there, uh, which it should be that way because some of these are time sensitive, right? If it's malignant melanoma, you don't want to be f- f- goofing around with going to your primary, and then you got to be referred. You want to be able to go right to the dermatologist. That's where Stanford's problem is, right? There's so many people trying to get in all of their specialties. It takes months to get in to see a doc at Stanford. So I don't know what the answer is. They built a new hospital, actually a huge new facility to handle this problem, but I don't know how much it's helping. Anyway, and then the problem with the ABCs, I mean, you need to do your job as a primary health care provider, but the problem with the ABCs is there are many disorders 
that will break these rules, right? We talked about keratosis, the great imitator, in the last lecture. That breaks all of these rules, yet it's, it's not cancerous. So, But that let the dermatologist make that determination. Okay, the types of melanoma. So we have superficial spreading is the most common type. So if you get a melanoma, about 70% of the time it will be this flavor, uh, which is, if you want to have one, I would say this is the one you want to have. The age of diag typical diagnosis is about 50. The radial growth phase, we talked about that, is long, considering this is a very deadly cancer. It's 8 to 24 months. So if you do notice a lesion, a flat lesion that shows up on your skin and it's growing, like it's spreading across the skin, get yourself to a dermatologist immediately to get that thing assessed, especially if it breaks the ABC rules, ABCDE rules. All right. Uh, this one, the patient's actually waited a little bit too long. Uh, see how it's it's very, first of all, let's look at it. It's densely variegated. It's black over here. It's almost skin color over here. It's brown over here. That's a very densely, very thickly, very, I don't know what the word is, very extremely visibly variegated. It's not lightly variegated where it's like, uh, is that brown? Is that variegated? Uh, I think it's variegated. That's like lightly or faintly variegated. These are coarsely, densely variegated. The borders are ridiculous. Well, you can't fold it in half. So that breaks that rule. It's the borders have big chunks out of them, very irregular. Here's a huge notch taken out. I mean, this is, this is superficial spreading malignant melanoma. And yep. Okay, we already said the radial growth phase, uh, 8 to 24 months. Although it could start anywhere, it usually starts sun-exposed regions of the trunk, like the upper traps in men, in women, on the back of the legs. Uh, it can start two ways. It can evolve from a mole. You could have a mole turn into this and start spreading out across the skin. About, in fact, about 50% of them start this way. Uh, although it's very rare. I don't want everybody to freak out. Moles are very rarely become cancerous. Uh, but 50% of them do start this way. Or then it can start de novo. What does that mean, de novo? That means it starts from scratch. It starts as a flat macule and it spreads and spreads and spreads and gets bigger and bigger. And then it starts becoming nodular. And that's what I was saying. Did I finish that thought? See how this one, the guys waited too long? Because we're starting to get a little nodular ridge right here. Right? So that's not, when you see nodules like that, it means it's growing down. The vertical growth phase has started downward. Okay. So lesions in situ, uh, that means that they're still in the radial. In situ means it's not metastasizing. All cancers in situ means it's cancer, but it's not near any blood vessels. It's not metastasizing. It's not thought to be metastasizing. So this form is still in the, in the radial growth phase. Uh, may even be in the upper part of the dermis too. The papillary layer, as long as it's not going heading toward the deep dermis or the subcutaneous tissue, as long as it's growing radially, it's still pretty treatable. And the treatment for these in situ lesions is quite successful. If you, so you catch it early, you can really treat melanoma. You can't monkey around with this one, though. Here's an in situ phase. So an in situ phase, they're typically black and brown, variegated, like this one. This is actually a, dermato, a dermoscope view, I believe. Uh, but nevertheless, we can still see it. We can really see it clearly. You're not going to see it this clear just with your naked eye or magnification glasses. Uh, but they're variegated, notched borders, as I said. It may even be under five, maybe four or five millimeters. It may be really small. So it's good here if you have if you're at risk for melanoma, even if you don't see any, that's good good idea to go in and get a baseline reading by a dermatologist so they can put on their 
gigantic glasses and they can start looking at these lesions. They may find one that's two, three millimeters and take it off before it has a chance to do anything. So it's good to get a baseline if you're at risk for this one. Okay, but this is interesting. So it's notched here. Uh, these little, that's a sign of melanoma right there uh, when they have these little dots like this. So I'm not going to get, I mean, that's getting out of my scope. I'm not a dermatologist myself, of course. So the second phase, as we said before, after this slow horizontal radial growth phase is over, uh, then the growth speeds up, and but it speeds up in a downward direction. That's called the vertical growth phase, uh, and it's very dangerous. I guess I could add vertical vertical growth phase. Let me make a note here. Dermatology. What is that? Slide 18. Add. Yeah, so we can add that to that. Uh, the lesions then, as the vertical growth phase, the quick, dangerous vertical growth phase, the lesion may develop some papules. Remember, a papule is a raised... Will you tell me what's a papule? It's a raised bump that's less than one centimeter in size. So it may develop into a papule. And that papule may grow to two centimeters, then we call it a nodule. All right. Okay, so this is a slow growth in, of an in situ lesion. So this was started out as a spreading melanoma superficial spreading, but now look what we got. Close to the superficial spreading melanoma, we got a, uh, a good sized nodule, or I'm not sure the size on it. It could be a nodule, could be a papule, but that's not a good sign. This region has entered the vertical growth phase. I'm sorry about the noise. We got the kids running wild early today, which I'm sure everybody working from home is excited about. Uh, indicates, uh, yeah, cancer, not a good thing to see this. Tumor regression. So this, yeah, that's right. These, these tumors can regress, but don't get your hopes up. That doesn't mean it's going to completely disappear. Uh, in fact, it's very unusual for it to completely. Uh, but about 66% of the tumors will have some patchy. Uh, I could actually add a patch in there. Uh, regression within the tumor. Let's go back and look at patchy regression. See how we got the tumor cells are kind of holes in them, right? Uh, that's the body's immune system attacking these things. Uh, so that is one of the reasons that people who are immunocompromised are at risk uh, for this condition. And so it proves that this is an immune, there's immune component to this disease. But again, it's rare for them to completely disappear. A gray color, if you see gray in your lesion, that can also indicate maybe a little gray right here. That's, that's, these are cells that are degenerating right there. So the body is fighting this thing, uh, which is a good thing. Maybe we'll slow it down a little bit. Here's another uh, dermoscope view of a superficial spreading melanoma, which doesn't look like it's went into the vertical growth phase yet. Uh, but you can see this, uh, I think it's called, they call this reticular formation. See how that looks like kind of spider webs? That's a sign of cancer. And you won't be able to see that with your naked eye. But we have a big lesion, a big hole in the lesion right here. Uh, so that's an area of regression and depigmentation. That also indicates that this is melanoma. The second most common, the nodular, okay, this is the bad one, right? Can draw skeleton here, right? This is the one that you don't want to have, and it is the second most common. Finish my skeleton. So it is the second most common type. Uh, it shows up in the 50s. About makes up if you're going to get melanoma about 22 percent, so it's it's definitely out there. About a quarter of melanomas are this type. This one's seen in sun-exposed regions, trunk, head, 
neck as well. So the nodules are typically black uh, or even blue. Some of them are in color. Sometimes they can be pink. The nodule may be ulcerated and even bleeding. That's a really bad sign, right? Uh, and these, as I said before, these nodular melanomas, they don't have a slow radial growth phase. They just pop up. The first, the first thing the patient notices is a bump on their skin. And so these, uh, and within months, it can be into the bloodstream. So these are really dangerous ones. And these are d believed to develop de novo. Typically have a poor prognosis, av obviously, because they're really hard to catch. If you see a bump, you try to get into Stanford or it, probably any big dermatological uh, clinic around here, the same. Uh, I mean, the thing could already be metastasized by the time you get in. So that's not a good thing. Okay, very aggressive, very bad. The third type is we talked about these lentigo malignant melanoma. Now, bologna doesn't, it's interesting, but the other authors talk about lentigo malignant melanoma only occurring on the face. Uh, bologna doesn't make that distinction. He says about 10% of the melanoma patients have this condition almost always seen on the face, according to other authors, so a little confusion there. Uh, there's two groups of people. People in their 60s tend to get this, and uh, shows up, shows up in people in their 20s, uh, especially people who have repeated exposure to sun and a long history of many sunburns. It's usually slow-growing. Uh, we talked about uh, it's not as fast as growing, uh, the macule is usually brown, brown to black. It could have nodules in it as well. It may not have nodules in it. They're usually very large lesions, though. Remember, we looked at this last week. Uh, sometimes they progress from lentigo malignant. We talked about lentigo malignant as a very slow-growing pre-melanoma pre type thing. About 5% of lentigo malignant lesions develop into lentigo malignant melanoma. Uh, they can be pretty tough to see. Uh, here's an eye, there's the, or an ear, here's the tragus. External acoustic meatus is there. Uh, and yeah, there, it doesn't look like much, does it? This, but, but again, it looks like, God, it's like gone here. Why is it so patchy looking? And that's an indication of melanoma when they look patchy like this. So the body's immune system is fighting this. Uh, so that is a lentigo malignant melanoma. There's the one from last week we saw. I mean, these are easy to see. Uh, even it might be a little nodule starting to form here. Uh, but yeah, these lentigo malignant melanomas are quite, quite large usually. Okay, let's talk about another one. This is called arcuolentiginous melanoma. So it's, let me see, uh, it's A like at, Acryl lentiginous melanoma, acryl lentiginous melanoma. Uh, about 5% of melanomas as well shows up in the 60s. These ones have a specific location. They only show up in glabrous skin, so your palms, your soles, or somewhere in the, the nail apparatus, right? Usually underneath the usually right uh, where the matrix of the nail is under the lo uh, luna is where they show up now these are the one black people are way high risk for these things 70 percent of these acryl lentiginous melanomas actually occur in black people so th they're at risk for these All right, the lesions typically present as brown to black macules. Uh, they're variegated. They have irregular borders. They're pretty easy to see, I think, on the, on the palms and on the soles. But the trouble is uh, when they get underneath the nail plate, uh, that can be trouble. That, the, the misdiagnosis rate is huge on these things, 33%. And the melanoma can occur in the nail matrix when it does. And if it occurs in the male, well, male, we'll look at nails next week, but if you get something in the nail matrix, instead of you having a spot on your skin, because that mole that you see, those cells are, are constantly changing. Those are not the same superficial cells 
they are changing, just sloughing off, just like your skin. Uh, but the uh, deep down in the stratum basale, the and we'll look at that next week. Uh, that that basal cell is producing overmelanated keratinocytes, and you you keep seeing that steady upward stream. But in the nail matrix, the stream goes forward. Right here's a nail. And so if you get a cancer spot, or if you just get a mole here in the stem cells uh, in the nail matrix, instead of coming out of the pane of the plage, uh, these cells grow, they spit cells longitudinally down the nail. So you see these streaks in your nail. Okay, um, so that's called longitudinal melanonychia, which is usually no big deal, very common in African Americans. But it can be cancerous, and we'll look at Hutchinson's sign when we get to that. It's one way you can kind of make the make the diagnosis of these things. But yeah, so uh, that's not a good place to have them. They can be confused with, they can present as longitudinal uh, melanonychia. It's another word for your vocabulary. And this is the type that killed Bob Marley. He got one uh, in the nail matrix underneath the nail plate. And he had, if it's un, if it's underneath the nail plate, it's called subungual malignant melanoma, which is a subcategory of acrolentiginous or lentigin, lentiginous melanoma. That's what killed Bob Marley. You know the story of that, right? I guess he sprained his ankle playing soccer, and he went to his primary doc. This is the rumor, anyway. He went to his primary doc, and the primary doc saw the spot underneath his toenail. And he said, you need to get this checked right away. He had a Hutchinson sign. And instead of going for mainstream medicine, he went for alternative medicine or herbs and spices and who knows what else, magnets maybe. Uh, and the cancer spread as melanoma will. And it got into his lungs and brain. And by the time he finally got to Miami, uh, it was too late. They couldn't, they couldn't help him. So this is not one to play around with. Here is a perfect case of subungual mel uh, melanoma, and these are these are not really longitudinal mel uh, melanonychia uh, because they're too thick. So you would be flagged this one right away. But you can see how you get these streaks, and it's starting to get into the uh, into the matrix here. You can see some black and darkness here. Not a great Hutchinson sign, but you can see it spread out into this region. Uh, this is a this is gotten into his organs for sure. This is uh, very advanced, right? So originates everything I said from the nail matrix. can be very difficult to visualize in early stages. It's how Bob Marley's cancer begun. Here's another one. Look at this one's got all the way up into the skin here. So this is uh, really, really bad. Acrolentigonous melanoma, even affecting the distal phalanx. Uh, and you can also call this one subungual, subungual melanoma. Okay, massive Hutchinson sign because of this. This one, I hope, if this guy came into your office, you'd know what to do, right? There's a nodular melanoma that is undoubtedly metastasized. That thing is huge. How about this one? What do you think of this one? Superficial spreading melanoma. It's flat. It's definitely variegated, coarsely variegated, super light over here, dark over here. What about this one? Well, it's variegated. I mean, you could almost fold this in half. It's not, it's not crushing the ABCDE rules uh, as much. Um, it's not, it's light, it's, I mean, it's not, it's brown here. But the other shades are not super coarsely variegated. You would still refer this out for sure, right? Uh, but this one actually ended up being seborrheic keratosis. Uh, or I'm sorry, it didn't. It actually turned out to be melanoma. Um, it, it looked like seborrheic keratosis. That's where I was going. I didn't see the next slide. Um, but yeah, it did turn out to be melanoma. But that one really looks like seborrheic keratosis. But I guess maybe this is a little nodular here. Uh, so you you can see, just follow the ABC rules and you'll be okay. 
Again, you've got to catch these things early. It's the key to survival. Uh, dermoscopy uh, has to be used for these things if there's any question. If, I mean, when in doubt, biopsy the thing. Uh, making the diagnosis also, the patient history, Bologna talks about to dermatologists about the importance of listening to the patient and taking a patient history, which they did very well. When they finally got into Stanford, I was very happy. Uh, they, they took a very good history. And uh, things like change in shape, change in color, and change in size when it becomes nodule, those are huge signs that this is a, a dangerous type lesion. Uh, and the changes are the most sensitive clinical findings we actually have. Uh, these, so the patient history can sometimes be more important than what the doctor sees with his own eyes and even uh, dermoscopy at the time of the visit. There are some other signs of melanoma we can talk about. Uh, if, if there's a history of inflammation around the lesion, whether it's there at the time of the visit or there's a history that there's a red ring around it, that's a bad sign that it's become um, into that vertical growth phase. Then there's the EFG rule. If it's elevated, firm, and growing, those are bad signs that it's malignant, that's in that vertical growth phase or beyond. This is the diagnostic accuracy of observation by just a dermatologist on average. It's only 75%. That's not great. But all dermatologists pull out those gigantic glasses, uh, dermoscopy, and that brings the accuracy much more comfortable level, 90%, but still 10% of these things can be missed. So the biopsy is the... Uh, is the important diagnostic key. Garb's rule of dermatology, uh, Bologna cites this verbatim per quote, if a patient is worried about a single skin lesion, don't blow it off, dermatologists, don't ignore it. Their suspicion their suspicion gives you, makes you have a low threshold for, for performing biopsy. Don't ignore their suspicion and have a low threshold for performing biopsy. Differential diagnosis. So there's a bunch of conditions that can imitate melanoma, uh, both clinically and histologically. Uh, so you can break those down into melanocytic and non-melanocytic. So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, so these are all of these with the exception of lentigo lesions, are nevi. These are all different types of moles that can look just like nodular melanoma. So an arc, arc, well, some of these we'll look at next week. Arcual nevi, an atypical Clark's nevi, uh, a atypical and even a typical Spitz nevi, congenital nevi, and lentigo. So those are all melanocytic, meaning the melanocytes are involved. Now there's some non-melanocytic nevi as well. Seberer keratosis does not involve the the melanocytes. And we talked about that. In fact, the name of that is the great imitator. Actinic keratosis, we've talked about that one last week. Uh, Hemangioma, that develops a thrombus inside of it, which happens, can look just like a nodular Melanocy- or nodular melanoma, uh, pigmented basal cell carcinoma. I don't think we're going to have time to get to this carcinoma. I mean, this is we need a longer dermatology course. Uh, but lentigo again can look uh, solar lentigo. Solar keratosis is lentigo. That should be. Shouldn't that be on the other list? I think that should be. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Superficial, let me make a note of 43. 43. Lentigo. Superficial basal cell carcinoma can do the trick. Your job as a primary health care provider, everything I've said Detect the ones that break the ABCDE rules and refer them to a dermatologist. Your job is done. Let the dermatologist figure out, take it from there. What about this lesion? Well, this is another one. It, it's, I mean, you would refer it out, right? It's 12 millimeters. It is, 
pretty uh, coarsely variegated because it's black here, it's super light here. It doesn't have the chopped uh, rat bitten border though, so it doesn't have all of them. Um, but that one did turn out to also be a malignant melanoma. It's getting a little nodular right here, so it's starting to go into the vertical growth phase. It's big. That one's big enough to definitely make you nervous. Uh, the prognosis, again, early recognition saves lives. I must catch it during the radio growth phase for a good prognosis, as we said. Sometimes uh, there isn't a radio growth phase, right, like the nodular form. And what are you going to do? You can't do anything. That's just, just bad luck. Just try to get into a dermatolog der dermatologist quickly. Maybe you can't go to Stanford. Just go to uh, some any dermatologist that you can get into quickly. Uh, once it gets into the deep dermis and subcutaneous tissues, you're in trouble. Uh, it's going to metastasize to wherever, the lungs, the liver, the brain, and you're in trouble. Look at this interesting one. Crazily darkly variegated, black hair. What's this indicate? Yeah, there's some regression going on. This is definitely a sign of, of superficial spreading melanoma. It's not, there's no nodule formation in it yet, but you would definitely refer that one out. Melanoma versus mole. Melanomas typically have, because it's hard to tell a melanoma apart from a, no, uh, a mole, obviously, because we, we saw they were, a whole bunch of them were listed, the spits. Uh, nevi in particular. Uh, but there are some ways you can tell them apart. So typically, melanoma is more densely variegated. There's huge color differences like that. Huge color differences, right? Uh, they're going to have notched in irregular borders. Does that have notched in irregular borders? Yep, it's got a bay right here. If this is all the ocean, and this is an island, it's got a big bay here. Can't fold it in half either. So the borders are really choppy on that. Uh, may grow in size. I mean, it will grow in size. I can get rid of May on 47. Not a new slide, right? I just built most of this lecture last night, uh, inserting that new book in here. Uh, they said don't rely on these differences, though, as we said, because they can break the rules. Maybe nodular. Moles aren't nodule. Moles are moles. Moles get warty looking. We'll talk about moles. How do you manage these things? So step one is to take a biopsy of it. It's got to go to the lab and you've got to determine what it is and what stage it's in. Uh, if it is cancerous, the next step is to determine if, how far it is spread. Has it gotten into the lymph system? They will do, I won't explain it, but they're, they're going to do a mapping of this and they're going to inject a radiographic uh, a um, tracer. Oh, sorry, uh, a tracer, a radioactive tracer. They'll inject into the lesion, and they can follow that radioactivity on scanning, and they will see where the nearest big lymph node is. They will find that lymph node and biopsy it. That lymph node is called a sentinel node. So these aren't the sentinel nodes up in the supraclavicular fossas. All right. If it's gotten into those nodes, then like this person, there's going to be a gigantic lesion, or, or the surgical excision is going to be huge, because uh, you got to make sure you go out to those, go out to those nodes. Okay. Surgical margin should be one to two centimeters around the tumor, and if you have to go out to the nodes, you have to go out to the nodes. What do you think about that? That uh, five millimeter lesion, I don't like that right there. That looks like nodular formation. I mean, it breaks the ABCs. You would f refer it out. That's all you got to do about that. But that was a superficial malignant melanoma that entered the vertical growth phase. And you can see the nodule right there. How about this one? You better not miss this one. Patient's wife says he was on his. Uh, this was on his back for two years. She was nagging him to come in. He's like, "Oh no, it's going away. Look, it's going away." Remember that regression is a sign of melanoma. So even though there's huge regression, we got a huge vertical growth phase here, right? So this is it. May be too late for this guy. This is going to be more advanced. 
right? So it's a superficial spreading again, which has progressed into the vertical growth phase. How about this one? Now, this is a good example of, it's a six millimeter lesion, so you would still refer it out. It's got choppy borders, uh, but the, this has been around for three years. It hasn't changed in shape or size. It's variegated, but it's this is not coarsely or densely variegated. It's kind of lightly variegated. So it's not, I mean, you still refer it out, but I think a dermatologist would take one look at this and say, oh, that's seborrheic keratosis. Uh, and that's exactly what it was, seborrheic keratosis. But again, primary health care providers, that's not our job to make that diagnosis. Our job is to just say, this needs to be referred out. How about this one? Here's, here's one of the ones I went into Stanford for. Uh, so this is blown up. So there's two crusty lesions right here by my AC joint. Right There's my neck starting right there. I've got a bunch of these little lesions. So crusty, kind of crusty, but very lightly variegated, but it still breaks the ABCs. Uh, it was, I mean, this one was six, seven millimeters. Uh, crusty, though. Crusty usually means what? Seborrheic keratosis. Uh, but nevertheless, I went in just to get it checked, and sure enough, it's seborrheic keratosis. Right? How about this one? So this popped up on the, this is the plantar surface of his foot. Oh, that's no good, right? That's that acrolentigenous melanoma. Uh, so that's not good. That was a melanoma. All right, so that's enough for today, enough for you guys to think about. We will, now you guys said you wanted the test on week seven, so next week we won't have class, but you will have your, your online dermatology test. Be ready to identify some images. All right, see you in the next video.